Well, hey there, this is Justin. Uh, this is going to be on the YouTube channel, uh, Fully Live Athlete Pastor channel. And usually what we do is we post our church's worship services on this channel every Sunday following the service. We'll just re- put the recording up there. You'll get the whole service. And you can follow along with the whole liturgy, which is incredible. And if you've never been to a Reformed Presbyterian church, I highly recommend it. It is the best order of worship going today. Believe it. So here's the thing. We didn't get a good recording audio-wise. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this audio commentary and place it over the video of the preaching of the sermon this week. And this was a doozy of a sermon. Uh, I about, uh, you know, (laughs) Cody and I were talking at the service and we're thinking, man, this is a great one. But then we realized it didn't really get recorded well. So we were disappointed that this wouldn't be posted online so others could hear it that we're missing in action this week and others could pull it up that are listening on watching online. So I hope that this will be one way you can benefit from the service, benefit from the preaching, even if you weren't there and even if you lo- usually watch it online or you're hoping to watch it online this time. And what preaching is, let's just start there. What, like When you listen to a sermon, what you're getting is is the very Word of God. It's God's Word preached through a man in time and space. It's a redemptive event where God speaks through the man speaking. In this case, me. You're seeing it on the video, right? And he's doing so in in that everything that's said that's derivative of his Word and applied particularly by his work of the Spirit in this instance, in this time and space work, to bring fruit that's been stored up, to bring blessings that have been stored up in eternity in himself down upon his people. That he's going to do work in the creature through the what they call the foolishness of preaching in God's word. It's such an unlikely thing to see a, a person speaking and then God using that sinner uh, the man be though he be a vile sinner though he be you know unworthy of course uh, none of us are worthy only Jesus is good but uh, we are you know redeemed people we are saints uh, because of the work of Christ and so here's a sinner a man speaking who is also a saint because he's justified in Christ and he's got good news to say and every Christian has good news to say because we have uh, been given the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we know that we have been forgiven in some way. We have been forgiven of our sins. And we experience the goodness of God every day. And we have a commission and a mission to go out and proclaim that good news. So so we're all preachers in some sense, but we're all sinners uh, still. So we're both preacher and sinner, uh, saint and sinner. Well, here I am, I'm preaching, and I'm going through this very objectionable very unpopular chapter. We're, we're looking at Romans 9. Romans 9 is one of those that, uh, it's like the crazy uncle that no one wants to, to have Thanksgiving with. He wants, we just want to lock him away. Uh, people will skip this sermon or skip this chapter when they get to it in churches. Uh, you know, it's like, it's not popular. So in the course of this argument that Paul's uh, engaged in in Romans, is he wants to really harp on the good news of the gospel, of course, which is that Men and women have been chosen by God in eternity to receive a righteousness that comes not by their works, but it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And so what what this means is that everything good or bad is excluded from those who are chosen and then when God relates to them. But what they receive is a righteousness based upon the law keeping of Jesus, that Jesus was born of a woman and was born under the law, and he kept the law of God. Go see Galatians 4.4. 4. He kept the law of God so that we might become children of God on the basis of Christ. And so what he's going to do is he's going to do active obedience. He's going to obey the law for us, and then he's going to do passive obedience. He's going to lay down his life on the cross for our sins. He's going to pay for our sins. And the question is, does this apply to all people or no? Well, no, it applies to those who are chosen, Right? The work of Jesus applies to the chosen people, the ones that are elected. So election is is this doctrine that says, well, 
God doesn't save everyone, obviously. Not all are saved. Well, who then are saved? It's the people that God's chosen. If no one was chosen, no one would be saved. No one would be redeemed. No one would come to Christ. But you, you look at Israel, a lot of these Israel people who have descended from Abraham didn't believe, and so God says, well, no, God's word didn't fail. Not everyone who's Israel is, is actually Israel. Not every, everyone who's ethnically part of this nation, part of the ethnic descendants of Abraham, are true believers. And so that's that's been the big question that's been going on through Romans 9. And as, as, you, as Paul's made the case that, you know, if you look at one example which would be Isaac and Rebekah, they had twins. And before the twins were born, as Malachi 1, 2, and 3 says, and this is in uh, the earlier part of Romans 9, if you look at it on the page, it says that before they were, good, before they were born, before they'd done good or evil, basically God's chosen one, Jacob, and not chosen the other. Out of the same sperm and egg, out of the same conception, from the same father, with no, re, with no regard for anything these people would ever do, good or bad, God set His love on Jacob and not Esau, and that's the reason why anyone is saved, as God has chosen you in eternity. Okay, and then so, the objection that we get in this part of Romans nine, is well. If that's the case, then why does God still find fault? Why does he... Uh, look, no one's resisting his will. He's sovereign. So why does anyone... Why would, why would God even judge us? And this is a, this is a really a, you know, <laughs> a butthead of an objection here, right? So you look at this. Like, what's going on? Why would, you, why would someone ask this? Well, this is someone who obviously does not approve of what he's hearing, right? Obviously, he's objecting, right? So, so what Paul does is he doesn't directly attack the objection. He doesn't directly answer it. He a he answers the question with another question, and he says, well, "No, no, no. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to its molder?" So, you know, I, I you know, in this, you know, in a sermon, it's always good to tell a little story to to kind of break the break the uh, the dialogue up here. It's good for communication. So. What I did was to illustrate this. I talked about the next line here, which is about pottery. And so the potter has no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use, right? Uh, the, the, the potter has, has the right uh, to make one vessel for these you know, high purposes and other for common purposes or even, you know, you know, gross purposes right like you know you can say you get, he wants to make a toilet and he wants to make you know this uh, beautiful artwork right so you know the question is uh, the potter has 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 absolute sovereignty here or the answer there so of course well thinking about you know the what I, one example I used was I talked about Legos and what, what what if we had talking Legos right you know Legos are just this nuisance where you you get the Lego and it, and it yeah, yeah, Legos that's strewn all over your house, and you step on them because they're everywhere, and they hurt your feet. But what if there were Legos that could speak? And if you had these Legos, uh, you know, we had a, a friend of ours who stayed the summer with us, and he was really good at building Legos. So what, what this guy does is he gets a vision of what he wants to make, and then he takes the Legos, he finds all the appropriate parts, and then he clips them together and, and snaps them all together so that he can produce what he wants and if it's and if it's for instance a plane an airplane then he will produce an airplane uh, if it's uh, you know, and he doesn't finish the airplane creation and the airplane creation looks back at him and says well I wish you would have made us into a car a, ve a vehicle like that so he's uh, that, that would be absurd there's no such thing as a talking Lego that's going to try to you know change what the builders intention is. Uh, it, it, the Legos are going to be locked in to the design of the builder. And we're talking about God. God is the creator. Uh, you, you know, that's why he says, who are you, O oh man? You're not a creator. Uh, are you able to make life? Now, I've made life, right? I have, you know, my wife and I have four children, but, uh, and they have names that we've named them, uh, but we don't decide how tall they are. 
we don't decide uh, what their personality is going to be. Uh, we don't decide uh, what's going to give them joy. We really don't. Uh, we can try to influence them. We don't. But at the end of the day, we don't impact their destiny or what they are going to be designed to be. Uh, we're secondary uh, causes in their creation. Ultimately, God is the creator of every single person. And so who do I think I am? Because God is the molder. He is molding every single person. He's molding history. So uh, the, the big analogy I kept going through throughout the sermon was, this is his story. Uh, this is the builder's story. This is the potter's story. His story. So when we're talking about history. We need to think about that there is a creator who fashioned all things out of nothing and has a purpose to fulfill in every single thing and some of those may be for honorable purposes and some of those may be for dishonorable purposes but we're all creatures in this and we have zero to say to the creator to the potter that is and so does God have a wonderful plan for my life uh, I couldn't tell you uh, God, I have to ask God for that right God has revealed certain things and if I'm a believer in Christ I can know I have he has a wonderful plan for me but I can't know that for every single person I can't know that in every exist every instance in my life what's going to be the purpose of or what's going to be the outcome here I can just know what the Lord has, has revealed in Scripture uh, because that's certain he never lies he's the potter and sometimes he discloses his intentions and his mind to us and so that's why we look to the Scripture to be our guide because it's the only infallible source of doctrine for life and practice to know who God is to know what he requires of us we want to have certainty and so we need to look at that well when you're talking about the potter language in scripture this the potter is a very uh, it's a very well known of course um, uh, phenomenon in, in ancient uh, literature or an ancient world uh, you know, a lot of pottery found in or archaeological digs wherever you go uh, potters would, would craft uh, artwork they, they create they create uh, uh, of course uh, storage uh, vessels all these vessels you know so some of them could be you know, noble uses some you know common uses well when you're talking about building and, and art artists and pottery well uh, what's interesting is that this potter language is used all over the Bible for God, right? It says in Isaiah 64, 8 that you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. And whenever you see that, that potter word there, that can also in Hebrew be used as a verb. And usually when you see it in the English, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's translated form, right? Um, it says uh, in um, Isaiah 44, 24, uh, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb, right? Uh, and it says, um, Psalm 33, 15, it says, he who fashions the hearts of them all. This forming, fashioning language, it's, it's the same way you describe how a potter works. God is described as the ultimate potter of every single person, their hearts their souls, their being, and our destiny, and our history. So God's a, God's a potter. He controls history. He controls all salvation. And who are we to question Him? And so, why doesn't God save everyone? Well, that's the second point in our in our, in our sermon today. And it's, uh, He's the potter. He has the right to form the clay how He wants. Right? So, that's the, that's the answer. So He's saying, who are these um, who are these vessels? to answer back to the one who formed it why'd you do this to me why'd you make me like this and so if you look at the next verse if you look at 22 it says what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction so he's saying why doesn't you know what you know, he can, he's, he's being patient with his vessels of wrath prepared for destruction why in verse 23 in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy so he's going to He's going to speak to the vessels of mercy, which he's prepared beforehand for glory, by delaying his judgment 
on these vessels of wrath by propping them up in order to cause him to fall ultimately and to show forth his riches of his glory to the vessels of mercy. So, so what Paul is saying here, he's saying like, for instance, Pharaoh, right? God forms the clay in such a manner to create pottery that tells a story. So, like Pharaoh is a piece of pottery in this instance. God's going to demonstrate a lot of patience. He's going to decree that that Pharaoh would be born about 1,500 years before the birth of Jesus. That this Pharaoh is going to be a royal son. He's fashioning him, he's forming him to take the helm of the nation of Egypt, which was an ancient powerhouse because God had already formed the Nile River there in creation. And it was it was a, a very rich and powerful nation. Here's going to be the most powerful man in the world. He's going to grow up to be the most powerful man in the world. And then God would, in another area, a thousand miles away, speak audibly to Abraham 500 years prior to Pharaoh's birth. And then he, that would lead Abraham to move about 150 years uh, later, or get, to get there about 150 years later, so that his great-grandchildren would be in Egypt. And then they would interact with Pharaoh, and they would become so numerous and flourish, and that they'd be a threat to this Pharaoh that Abraham didn't even know, right? He, was, he died many, many years before Pharaoh was born, right? So this Pharaoh would treat them poorly, and then Moses, who would be born during Pharaoh's day, would be miraculously preserved by Pharaoh in his house and protected. And then Moses would, about 40 years after his birth, would murder someone and then be uh, exiled into the wilderness where he would go and um, learn to be a shepherd for his people and that he would be called by God himself audibly to go and, and confront this Pharaoh who was drunk with power and, he, and, and then he would give him miraculous signs, sign after sign, ten miraculous signs and Pharaoh would refuse to let the people of God go over and over again, right? Ultimately, uh, God was fashioning Pharaoh, hardening his heart so that he would become this story to show to the vessels of his mercy, in this case Israel, and then all the readers of Scripture and all the hearers of this preaching, so that those vessels of his mercy would see in God's fashioning the vessels of his wrath the glories of his power, the glories of who he is, right? If you look at verse 24 and verse 20, or verse 23 there, uh, the riches of his glory for the vessels of his mercy. He's telling a story through his fashioning pot, uh, the, uh, Pharaoh as this pottery. When I was in Israel, I uh, purchased a, a necklace for my wife. It was a, it had turquoise Roman glass on it. And I think this article or this artifact really speaks to this story is that Rome was an unquestionable powerhouse uh, throughout the, the ancient world, right? Uh, Daniel and Revelation, though, speak to how it was built up in order to be crushed. My wife is wearing shattered glass from that empire today on her neck. It's, isn't it fascinating that you know, in 2022, in the middle of the USA in Oklahoma, is a message to a vessel of his mercy of the riches of his glory. That same nation that rejected Jesus, that, that crucified him, was defeated in two ways in his story. It was one, militarily shattered in the 4th century. But right here where Paul is writing to the Romans, it's, been, it's being spiritually shattered into a million pieces as, as her, her citizens previously under the dominion of evil, under the dominion of idolatry and devotion to an emperor creature, much like Pharaoh, right? They've turned away from worshiping idols and worshiping an, a human being to worshiping the true and living God. That's why Paul is writing the letter of, of Romans. And you see that these vessels of wrath become a story to speak to the vessels of mercy about the glory of God. That's the Roman Empire. That's the meaning of its history. Is that it's shattered. We're wearing pieces of it on our necks now. 
And Christ is in heaven ruling. Christ is coming again to, dest to destroy all opponents and to redeem all of his people. In the final point of the sermon this week, I looked about how, how in verse 24 through 29, his story is the fulfillment of the salvation by God's grace described in the whole Old Testament. He cites Hosea and he, and he cites Isaiah and he speaks of the, the way they comment on Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And, he, and so the first analogy or the first analogy there he uses is, is Hosea. Hosea uh, was to, to look at Israel and this is talking about the 8th century BC. He spoke to the northern kingdoms, which the northern kingdom, which is the ten tribes are in the north, uh, and and he goes to them and, and he tells them about the Assyrians are going to come and they're going to take them off into captivity because they've worshipped other gods. And then it, and then you've got Isaiah who's going to speak about the same time to the southern kingdom, which is Judah and Benjamin, the two southern tribes, and he's going to tell them eventually this is going to be their destiny. Also, is that the Babylonians are going to come. And take them into exile. But what God's going to do by his grace is he's going to preserve a remnant. Though they've broken the covenant, the nation of Israel has broken the covenant, God will bring back a remnant. His promises will not fail. He still has vessels of mercy. And this the Assyrians are going to be crushed. The Babylonians are going to be crushed. And though he used them for his purposes there, they will be crushed, right? Those vessels of wrath are going to be a testimony to his vessels of mercy. And about 500 years prior to the birth of Jesus, the people will return and God will demonstrate that he had these people who were not his people. Israel became just like the nations, but they've been brought in to the promised land again, back to the promised land. Originally, the people came in out of Egypt. Now they're going to come back out of Babylon and it says in 27, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved, and the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. So it says, essentially in 29, The Lord of hosts has left us. Uh, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. So what he's saying here in the word of God is that if it wasn't for God's sovereign purposes being fulfilled in history, we would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. We would have no, there'd be no descendants here. There'd be no children of God, right? But the promise is he's going to take people who are not his people, as Hosea says, and, and repeat it in 25, and he's going to call them my people. He's going to call them his beloved. Well, the question is, how is he going to do that? Because we're all sinners, as we've said over and over again. We're sinners. You know, we are sinners. How can God call us his people? And it says in 26 that they're going to be called sons of the living God. How can God do that? How can he be just and call sinners who are so bad they've got to be exiled, so bad they've got to be removed from the promised land? How can he call them sons of the living God? We're sinners. How can God save sinners? The answer is in the gospel. It's that Jesus, the Son of God, was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, right? It's that 500 years after the return of the remnant, there was a remnant there in Israel, in the hill country of Nazareth. Here is Mary, a young lady, and she, can, she the, the, the Lord Jesus was conceived in her womb. And he would be fashioned he, the creator who made all things, would be fashioned into a vessel of God's wrath. He would be the vessel of God's wrath who would carry all of these sinners who were not his people with him to the cross to become a vessel of wrath for the vessels of his mercy. He was cut off for the remnant. He was that vessel of wrath who was smashed to demonstrate to the vessels of his mercy the riches of his glory, the glory of God. You see that only in Christ, only him being crushed as a vessel of wrath can God justify sinners for us. Our sins had to be borne by another. We couldn't bear them. So our Heavenly Father 
gave us full rights into the kingdom to be sons of the living God, full rights to be this remnant because of what the Son Jesus Christ did, the vessel of his wrath to become a vessel of mercy for all the vessels of his mercy. And we can only look to Christ and clearly see the demonstration of the riches of his glory. Now we can see pictures of that in what God did with Pharaoh. We can see pictures of that in, in how God destroyed Rome. We can see pictures of that and how he crushed Babylon and Assyria. You know, we can see those pictures, but ultimately the biggest and best and the ultimate pictures of God using in patience to show his wrath and to make known his power endure with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction Christ was prepared for destruction so that God could make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy we preach the gospel of the crucified Savior Jesus Christ the true son of the living God so that we could become sons of the living God and when we preach that people hear it and they come alive sinners who were dead in sin who were sons of wrath become alive because God makes them alive. The Holy Spirit changes their hearts when they hear this gospel. And this gospel has been going forward from the days of Paul. Paul spoke this gospel to the Gentiles and we've been speaking it uh, throughout the world and people have been hearing it and churches have been, been being built through this gospel of a of a <laughs> the Son of God becoming a vessel of wrath. To bear the wrath of God on the cross and to rise on the third day for the justification of all who will believe, all who believe in Christ, all their sins will be forgiven and they will be declared righteous in Christ through the vessel of wrath. He became a vessel of mercy so they could become vessels of God's mercy and vessels of his glory. He transforms us. So his story is still being written. You and I will either be decimated as Sodom and Gomorrah or we will escape because of the righteous one uh, you know he will he, the righteous will not perish with the wicked as Abraham prayed in Genesis 18 he says don't sweep away the righteous with the wicked you know if there's just if there's 10 people there you can't do this if there's only 10 righteous people you can't destroy the city there's not found 10 the only three that escaped were Lot and the two daughters and they were not righteous people they are righteous because of the imputed righteousness of Christ gifted to them. They were, they were saved on the basis of Jesus who was to come, the true vessel of mercy for their sake. And so they didn't bear the wrath of God on Sodom and Gomorrah. They were, they were spared. They were redeemed, you see. Well, you get a little taste of this uh, grace sometimes, and you don't fully understand it. And you, you might you might tend to think in pride about how you're better than the other people out there that don't, that reject Jesus and you're a, you're one of the one of the good ones and you know that, that's a that's a mis, complete misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches. You know, we're all debtors to mercy alone, and you know you start to participate in this, you tend to forget. You know, well, who do you think you are? Who are you, oh man, to answer back to God? Don't you know? He's the potter, you're the clay. You're only what you are because of what he has done and is doing and will do. And if you have heard this and you can believe it, uh, you're, you're, experience, you're experiencing the work of God for you. I you know, closed this sermon on Sunday uh, mentioning that I've been teaching my sons how to drive. They're both teenagers now, and so I drive them around. And they've, they've been driving a few times with me. And, you know, so... Uh, the first time, this is the first time this last weekend when uh, my oldest son parked the car in the garage, and he, as he parks the car in the garage, he looks at me and he's like, "You know, Dad, I think I can. I do this better than you do." And I told him, "No, no, no, you don't do this better than I do. I've been driving since I'm 27, or tw so I've been driving 27 years. I'm 43 now. Uh, you have nothing on me. I've got driving skills you'll, you you don't even have any idea about. Uh, but it's like." Yeah, he does one good parking job. And he thinks, well, he's got it. You know, uh, he's better than his dad. Well, I feel like that's us too. You know, we we sort of get 
this pride. You know, we think we we we're we're sufficient. We know what we're doing. We don't need Jesus. We're fine. Um, we have nothing to say here. I mean, He's the Creator. Uh, we are, we are uh, infinitely below Him, and and the good news is we don't have to be the Creator. We don't have to be the Sustainer. Uh, we are the clay, and He is the Potter. He's driving all of history to its great fulfillment when the when the Christ returns, and we will see all of His glory. But we can rest in that. That we don't we we can go along for the ride. We can go on the mission uh, of Christ. And realize that uh, we don't have to be bigger than we think we are. We don't have to boast. What's funny also is that my, uh, my son, uh, Owen, or my second son, he was driving for his first time. He says, you know, I think I'm better than Knox. You know, and it's like my oldest son. It's like, you know, we get a little bit of, a little bit more of experience and we tend to think we are something. And this, this text blows our pride out of the water. It says, who are you, O oh man, to say to God? Uh, who are you? To answer back to him, as verse 20 says, our God is way more merciful to any of us than we ever deserve. And so if you're hearing this and you want to know Christ, it is time to believe in him. It's time to rest in him alone. It's time to trust in Jesus for salvation. And you can bow to him willingly now or you'll bow to him someday. You can bow to him in mercy today or you can bow to him in wrath that is to come. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches here. It teaches, read the text, read Romans 9, 19 through 29, and see what it says for yourself. Well, I hope this is helpful. Uh, again, we preach the Word of God every Sunday in our services. We have a, a scripture-filled liturgy that is life-giving, and, and I'm thankful for it each and every week. It, it blesses my soul to participate in a gospel, Bible-centered church. And we're a kingdom-centered church. We're hoping to, to plant more churches in Oklahoma. We're praying for that end. And so we want you to come and participate with us in that journey. As you see people come to Christ, see men and women's lives transformed by the gospel. Uh, we want you to be a part of that too. So go ahead and come visit us in person. Uh, click on the subscribe button for the channel, uh, like it, share it, ask some questions. Uh, if you're new to this doctrine of election, uh, we understand how how maybe you haven't heard it before, and we, we're sorry about that, but it is essential for you and your joy and your assurance and your hope to know who God is and to know who you are as a creature. Uh, so with that said, I'll sign off for now. I hope this little commentary has been helpful for you uh, as you are thinking about these things. Go back and read Romans 9 and come at me with questions. I'd love to dialogue with you about those questions that you have. So we'll see you next time. Uh, every Sunday, 10.30 a.m. live, and then you'll see the review or the uh, recap of it following on either Sunday or Monday. Take care, guys. God bless. Bye.